What's going on, y'all? Everybody, this is Alfie D and Place to Be. The Place to Be is Streets Talk Podcast. And today, we have a great interview today. We have um, this, this man basically started from the bottom. Now he's almost at the top, pretty much at the top here in the city, in our <laughs> neighborhood. This man pretty much been born and bred here in Baltimore City. He went to the University of Maryland. Also, University of was that the uh, University of Baltimore County as well, where he got his master's degree. Also, this man been a community organization, been, been a community organizer for some years now, and went to step on up to be a councilman, councilman of the eighth of the eighth district, councilman Christian Barnett. How you doing uh, today, thank sir? Thank you, thank you, thank you, friend. Hey, I'm I'm doing all right. Uh, hanging in there, trying to trying to make it, trying to keep keep pushing the city forward. Um, but I do want to thank you for the opportunity to to come and speak to your listeners today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on here to speak to um your constituents. And basically, what I wanted to bring you on here today is because there's a lot of people out here right now that don't really, I mean, they know you, they see your face on TV. You know, they you know they see you, you know, with the human trafficking campaign. They see you in the streets. You know, I, I didn't see you out in the streets with a broom. I seen you out here with some with uh, trash bags. I seen you out here with your with your sleeves rolled up. So I mean, you're in the community. You're out here helping. You're doing the things. I didn't spoke with you many a times on several on several different things. And you always was always there in the community. So I feel as though it's like I you know I feel like it, I'm supposed to be sitting up here telling the people how great you are. But I'm gonna let you do that for me. No, I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, I, I uh, ended up in the Edmonton Village area um, about 10 years ago uh, I, as a third-generation homeowner there. Um, my, my dad actually grew up in the village. Uh, my grandfather moved there in, in 1967 when he came here from uh, South Carolina uh, to start his family here. Uh, and, you know, my, my dad's wedding gift for me and my wife after we graduated from uh, University of Maryland uh, was cheap rent for a year. Uh, and in that time, it was just trying to help us get on our feet. And it was really the best thing he could have done and the gift that continued to give um, to me and my wife. Um, because, you know, we, we, we settled right in, um, got involved in our local community association, uh, started advocating for, for just improvements, you know, at Edmonton Village Shopping Center and, and healthy food options. Uh, and at the time, I was working as a community organizer. Uh, I was a, worked at a labor union at one point, worked for a community development corporation at one point, uh, but again, also served in my, my local community association, just trying to help out and lend a hand. Um, and through that work, um, started to get more involved in, um, you know, city politics and, and just really just try, paying more attention as to what was happening, what wasn't happening uh, in, in our communities. And the more I continued to look and, and advocate, um, it became apparent that, you know, more work needed to be done that really in, in involved the community and showed uh, leadership at the local level. Uh, and so after talking over my family uh, and friends and, um, you know, and also just, you know, working uh, and, and people in the neighborhood asking me if I'd ever thought about running for office it was really never a lifelong plan. I mean, I, my, my, my education is in public policy, but... I was never trying to be a politician, if that makes sense. I, I wanted to help write policy. I wanted to advocate, but I didn't necessarily need to be that in that position. Um, but when the community pushes you to, to step up, you got to listen. Uh, and so in 20, 2015, um, right after the uprising, I ended up launching my campaign um, uh, and knocked on over 10,000 doors. But, you know, a lot of folks had already known me. At that point, I was helping to run the Edmonton Village Farmers Market. I was running Neighbors Without Borders, which was a, a advocacy group trying to leverage improvements for the Edmonton Village Shopping Center and along the corridor. Uh, and so folks knew, knew who I was. Um, and But, you know, being a pretty young guy, they also were asking me pretty regularly, how old are you? Uh, it, was, it was a pretty common question. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know, I was young, but ambitious. Uh, and, you know, and from there, I ended up winning in the 2016 city council election. Um, it was a very difficult race, but I think the connection to the community is what pushed me over the top. Folks knew who I was. Um, and I, thankfully, you know, in that, that term, I was blessed to get another one um, based on the work I did over the last four years. So I was reelected this, this November uh, to my second term on the city council. 
Uh, and it really just, it's, it's a, an honor and a privilege, you know, it's something I don't take lightly uh, because I know, you know, the expectations are incredibly high for this community that has been um, disinvested for a long time. And not just the Edmonton Village area, you know, I represent uh, over 30 neighborhoods, 40,000 people, uh, the district stretches from uh, the bottom, which is like the Beachfield, Irvington uh, area, uh, through the Edmonton Avenue corridor, up through Cook's Lane, uh, and I go all the way up Forest Park uh, into the Forest Park, Howard Park communities as well, uh, and top out at Liberty Heights Avenue. So it's actually the second largest uh, geography on the council, uh, and like I said, around 40,000 people. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot of issues, a lot of uh, diverse communities. Um, but a lot of need. And so I, I, you know, I've been known as the Edmonton Village guy or area guy because that, that's where the, the most needed in my opinion, you know, not that other parts of my district don't, don't, don't need me. And when they call, I absolutely uh, run, run the support and see how I can be helpful for them. Um, but, but this area, both just the personal connection for me and the, um, you know, the amount of, of challenges that we have, um, it's a, it, you know, it was a strong community at one point and it still can be. And in some ways still is, there's still a lot of long-term residents, which is what, kept me here with just so much story, so much history. You know, people don't leave. Uh, they come right, and if they do, they come back. Um, and so for me, that was a, a privilege to, to continue to serve in this work. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm happy to talk about policy or, or ideas, any questions you have, but you know, that's who I am. Yeah, exactly. So uh, for, uh, one thing I want to do is I want to thank you because we all uh, know we suffered a little bit of a, you know, kind of a tragedy because the Emerson Village Shopping Center to me, you know, that was like my childhood playground, you know. We didn't from went from carrying bags to hanging out, and you know, I mean, that's how I got really, you know, in touch with a lot of my people in my community was hanging in Emerson Village Shopping Center, from the barber shop closing down. That's if 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 not the only black owned business that's up here in this area, but but I know it had to be one of the oldest, if not the oldest. I think they've been here since the '60s. So right there, that was near and dear to my heart. And then I want to thank you for being up there late at night, out of nowhere, out there, you know, giving us the the breaking news and reports and things like that because I had to, not to say the pleasure, but I was had to be coming home and I had to catch a little bit of the fire and I, you know still a little upsetting to me. You know that's twice in one year. So do right now do you know do you have any other updates or anything what's going on or anything you know any concerns or anything like that for the people in the community that you know want to know you know a little bit of things because there's a lot of stores up there. There's a lot of older folks around here in this, in this neighborhood that. You know, depend on family dollar and things like that. So, anything you know, any new news or anything that's going on with that? Yeah. So right now, I mean, it's, it's under investigation. Um, you know, I, definitely the devastation to the community. I was actually, in fact, just yesterday I was waiting in line at the the giant uh, just across the way, and I, a lady in front of me. I don't think she she knew who I was, but she you know she wanted to talk about it. And you know, one of the things that she mentioned was like the how affordable the family dollar was for her and you know that she was going to have to go out to the west side shopping center uh, and take a couple buses in order to, to you know replace the goods that she was buying there because she couldn't afford to take some of the things at the giant uh and so you know that's always that kind of constant reminder that people are, are really really doing not doing well uh economically uh and not in just in this community but across the city especially you know it's magnified now by being in a pandemic uh, and so I think the loss of it um, or is definitely um, devastating for, for, for people, yeah. uh, for businesses, for the community, all of the above. Um, as far as updates, I mean, it's being investigated. I, I don't have any uh, information at this time as far as what the cause was or, or what the recovery timeline will be. Um, if the folks recall, the, the fire, the last fire was in November 2019. And, you know, the recovery from that took several months and yeah. it still was ongoing. I mean, they had not um begin to build in that space um and so you know these investigations can take several months of course the, sec the second i get any information I, I will absolutely share it out with the community but you know uh, right now um you know the, the initial stages are always trying to stabilize the building making sure it's safe um and you know so inspectors are on site they were on site yesterday i was up there yesterday as well and, and can confirm that both fire investigators and the owner of the property uh, team was on site as well, trying to figure out what the cause was so that they can uh, try and have a faster resolution because the last time it took, you know, three to four months to get an answer on the, the cause, which they ended up not being able to identify a cause uh, from the 2019 fire. Uh, and that was simply because it burned so long yes. um, that there was no material left for them to, to figure out uh, what, what may have initiated the fire. 
But there is a couple of things that do stand out uh-huh. uh, that I'm, I actually have a, a meeting with Mayor Scott this week to talk about. Um, so in both fires, uh, they were it was continued as long as they were because of a ruptured gas line. And in talking to the fire department on site on Saturday night, while the fire was raging, I, I could hear BG, I could hear on the, the fire chief radio that BG and e had arrived and they, they were trying to access the fire, the, the gas line to get it turned off. And eventually they did. But in talking to them, you know, one of the things he mentioned was that the infrastructure is so old that, you know, to have five or six businesses on one gas line and the fire gets into that line, it makes the fire way more devastating than it probably would be otherwise. And so we're going to be talking about, um, you know, put, putting together recommendations for the ownership to upgrade their infrastructure on site, um, especially so that that kind of thing doesn't happen. It needs to be modernized. I mean, as you know, it's one of the oldest shopping centers in the country, uh, yes. and actually, some believe it's the first of, its, uh, of that design on the, in the Northeast region. And yes. so it has a, a tremendous amount of history and meaning to this community. Um, and, you know, we, we have to, to make those improvements. But the challenge is it's private property. So as much as, you know, I absolutely have been advocating before I was in office, while I've been in office, to the ownership to make the necessary both infrastructure upgrades and, and modernization um, of the facility, you know, we can't make them do it. And that's been the biggest heartbreaker for me. Uh, it's not that, you know, you don't you want to always be able to tell somebody how to run their business, but for me, this is something that is so critical and so important to this community that I want it taken as seriously as you all take it, right? Yeah, uh, and exactly. so uh, our hope is that this will be a wake-up call for the ownership team because, look, them not having tenants is not good good for their business, right? So they're, they're going to feel the pinch. And so I think we may be at a time now where they will take the, the city serious and our calls for um, modernization, which is in response to what I'm hearing every day from my constituents. Yeah, exactly, because if you go back and look at all the pictures of Emerson Village Shop Center, like you said, I think it is the first of its kind on the East Coast. The other one was over in California back in, I think, in the 50s or something like that. But the same infrastructure and everything has been the same ever since then. So it haven't been no upgrades pretty much, only but the signs and things like that. So that right there, I can kind of believe that, you know, that played a big factor on why that why, why it burnt so fast and so quickly. Exactly. But um, I want to, you know, I'm going to change – topics real for, for a second my daughter right now she's in you know in school they talk about social studies and you know we're trying to you know explain you know about the different branches and everything so a lot of people don't know exactly what is the job as a city councilman yeah it's a great question and one that um i, I definitely glad, glad she asked and uh we definitely try to push the word out because there is some confusion about you know with the councilman versus the delegate versus senator versus the congressperson um and, and so forth so essentially, if you think about, um, you know, your early civic classes, we learn that there's usually three branches of government. And oftentimes there's a focus on, you know, con- the congressional branches, right? But our, our local government is broken down in the same way. And so we have the a- administrative branch of government, the administration, which is the mayor's office. The mayor, the mayor uh, controls all of the city agencies, their operations, how they run, like the day-to-day running of the city is done exclusively, almost exclusively by the mayor's office. You then have the legislative branch of government. And so when we think about the national level, the legislative branch is Congress. Well, as in Baltimore, the legislative branch is your city council. So the city council is made up of 14 council districts. Each district has about the same number of people. And boundaries change every census. So we'll, we'll and some of the neighborhoods will, will shift after in a couple of years, but uh, essentially there's 14 of us that represent about 40,000 people each. And we represent the legislative branch of government. You also have your council president, which is elected as a, a citywide representative. So that's your council rep that's like across the whole city. Uh, and that, that member that, you know, is uh, Council Member Mosby, Council President Mosby, Mayor Scott are in, in the top of those positions. And then your, legis- your, your legal branch uh, of government is the court system. Uh, and so those are the, the breakdowns. Um, the, the council itself, um, our power is solely rest in the ability to write laws, write and approve laws. Um, you know, we often get calls for a lot of things, <laughs> but the only real authority I have is to, to write laws. And so, you know, whether that's, um, you know, I've done a lot of work around human trafficking and I've written laws that, you know, um, work on like 
uh, in training hotel workers on how to identify things that, that stand out to them or signage. I've done work on affordable housing and uh, government operations, but essentially my ability is to propose ideas, propose laws, and then the council votes on them. So no one council member is any stronger than the others uh, because each of us carries one vote. In order to pass a bill, we need eight votes to pass a bill, um, a majority. Uh, and so that requires a lot of lobbying and talking to colleagues and working with communities to advocate uh, because, you know, like I said, I only carry one vote. So, you know, people may want to see certain things happen, but a lot of it requires um, negotiation skills and the ability to, to build relationships and work across different ideologies because every council member is different. Everyone has different priorities, different districts, different things that they care about. And so much of my day is spent thinking through challenges that uh, arise in the city and trying to figure out, is there a way to legislate a fix for this? Now, there may not always be a bill. Sometimes that means I just need to work with the mayor's office to make a change, right? If there's like a DPD, DPW water billing problem or, you know, a lot of these issues that come up in the news aren't really um, within the purview of the city council, but it doesn't mean that that's where I put my other hat on. It's just community advocate. Hey, Mr. Mayor, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. Can we make these changes um, to address the needs of the community? And so part of my job is lobbying and advocating for the community. Part of my job is legislating and voting. Um, and so that I hope that answers the question. But so that's that's pretty much what what the city council does. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you know we differ because it, it, we differ from you know the, our equivalent would be the state delegation. Our state delegates. There's a legislative branch at the state. The governor is the administrator. Um, and so sometimes there may be issues that are at the state level, right? So when we talk about schools, yeah. which are controlled by the state, and the school board or policing, which is controlled by the state, those issues I may take to our state delegates and say, hey, can you guys help me out with this issue? Or can you put a bill in to work on this issue? Or I need to work with the governor's office to deal with things like unemployment uh, and stuff like that. So um, a lot of it's working across different government agencies. Uh, some of it's working um, among the council, but most of my day is spent you know, answering constituent calls, constituent emails, um, trying to follow up and make sure things get done. So it's, it's a pretty tough job. Yeah, exactly. Pretty tough job. So basically, so it sounds like to, it sounds like a bunch, it's like, 14 CEOs of different districts basically come together to basically try to make their company, which is Baltimore City, a better place. That's what it sounds like, you know, breaking it down in layman's terms. Is, yep. is that true? That's a way to think about it. Okay, yep. exactly, exactly. So so that right there would be able to help out a lot of people that don't know. You know, a lot of people might think that, you know, you might have some kind of power as though over the police inside the cities or basically like, you know, basically like a, a mayor of things like that. But like you said, you're basically – developing bills trying to get them passed and doing a lot of lobbying trying to you know move things and also a little it, it, for the little things in the neighborhood that you know a little nuisance things like um like you said dpw and trash and things like that is that your office gets a lot of calls and things like that on yeah yeah oh, exactly yeah so, i mean that's those two days are like but yeah that's a great way to think about <laughs> it like we're, we're 14 individuals that represent a bunch of different issues and we all advocate to make things done get things done but um, but you know, like I said, it's, 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 that's a, it's a great way to frame it. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. Like a small CEO, cause people think we're all like little mini mayors. We're not like, I don't, <laughs> the mayor is the mayor. I mean, Baltimore is the structure of Baltimore's government is very mayoral focused. Yes. There's some cities and municipalities that have very strong councils and the mayor is weak. We're not one of those. We have one of the strongest mayoral, mayoral controlled form of government in the country. Actually, St. Louis is probably the only similarly sized city that has a stronger mayor than we do. And when I say strong, I mean like complete control over the budget, complete yeah. control over the of, of spending of all the agencies. There's other you know, jurisdictions that, that a lot of that would come through the council, but our government just wasn't built that way. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't mean that we're off the hook for the direction that the city goes, but it does mean that we're not necessarily on equal footing with the mayor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I do try to... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to I want to touch on human trafficking for a little bit before we um because I I see the time I know, I know you have to get out of here soon but I just want to touch on that because I know that's like basically basically one of your babies since you know since you've been inside the office and what what for human trafficking because we all know that's been you know been going on for for years but for for the last past I would say maybe fifteen years it seemed like it's been getting stronger and stronger we've been having a lot of we've been having a lot of different uh 
I want to say different black, brown kids that have been coming up missing, things like that. Also, you have people who's coming in from other countries illegally and things like that. And they bring it over here on a, on thinking they're coming up for a better life in which they're not coming for the better life. They're coming over here to be, you know, in the human trafficking slave, I mean, um, slaves in the human trafficking. So what brought that to, mm-hmm. what made that one of your babies here in the city? So I'm going to tell you, when, whenever we say call your council member, reach out to your elected official, if you have an issue, give them a call. That's how that came to rise. When I, when I um, ran for office, like I said, I, my background was in organizing and, and food issues. I didn't know anything about traffic. And obviously, I knew it existed like everyone else, but it wasn't something that was, I was an area of expertise or focus for me. And then I had a constituent um, reach out to my office. At the time, that constituent was a counselor at Western High School and mentioned that one of their students uh, had gone missing and was being trafficked in D.C., and their parents were looking for, for her, the little girl, um, and they ended up finding her. But I, my constituent came to me, and literally, <laughs> uh, I want to say I was at a community meeting, and pulled me to the side and was like, look, you got to do something about human trafficking. Shared the story with me about the little girl, and it was heartbreaking for me. And so, you know, the first thing I did was call a hearing. I was At the time, I was on the um, education committee on the city council, and so I reached out to the education chairperson for that committee. I forgot to mention it in my sort of civic class. And I'm happy to do a longer civic one-on-one. I have a presentation that if you wanted me to bring it back on, I could do a deeper dive into a lot of the, the city operations. But the, the chairperson for that committee um, put together a hearing for me, a public hearing, so we could just hear from survivors, hear from uh, organizations that help people, um, hear from you know law enforcement agencies on like what was going on in the city of Baltimore. And I'll tell you to date, that was the hardest hearing I've ever been a part of, man. My, my eyes are watering, like hearing the stories of what people had gone through, hearing the struggles of the organizations that do the work to try and help people and really didn't have the money to, to do everything that needed to be done to address this issue. And also just, you know, as I started to look at the city's, um, you know, codes and laws around it, wasn't really a lot of work being done to coordinate the city's efforts. Uh, to end this issue in Baltimore City. Uh, and so after that hearing, uh, I worked with then Mayor Pugh to get her to hire a human trafficking coordinator. Uh, and, and this gentleman that's actually still with the city, his name is Tom Sack. And so he worked in the mayor's office of criminal justice. And he and I created the first ever Baltimore City Human Trafficking Collaborative, uh, which has since grown to over 55 member organ uh, partners so that's law enforcement community-based organizations advocates uh faith leaders church leaders um hospitals i mean you name it they're here survivors um we have uh, several subcommittees that uh now work uh across a number of issues from public awareness to victim services uh to um helping me write laws and policies uh, working with the state task force there's a state of Maryland Human Trafficking Task Force that we are a part of. So we're actually, we've grown to the biggest uh, local task force in the state of Maryland. Uh, and, and part of it, we also have some of the biggest challenges in the state of Maryland, right? So a lot of it has to do with our location and proximity to DC, um, to New York, and just being along the 95 corridor um, where, you know, a lot of trafficking traffickers move between states. Uh, we're in the wealthiest state or one of the wealthiest states in the country. So there's a lot of money here. There's casinos, there's truck stops, there's ports. Uh, and so all of the things that um, that traffickers sort of rely on, uh, and you, you you framed it in the right way, it's slavery. This is a modern form of slavery uh, that is a global billion-dollar business. Uh, and so that makes it incredibly challenging to work on. Um, but since we started with our task force, uh, I mentioned that money piece. Um, for the last uh, two years, and, and, and I think this will be a third, We've gotten out so far over $600,000 to community-based organizations that help victims um, get out of that life and return to normalcy, which has been a huge boost. Uh, We have a a new partnership with all of the hospitals in the city of Baltimore to better help them identify uh, potential victims of human trafficking or uh, domestic violence or sexual abuse um, uh, called the Blue Dot Campaign. Uh, I don't really want to go into what it does, but it is a, the first of its kind in the region, uh, just, just to protect the anonymity of the program, but it's, it's an amazing program. Um, we've increased the training of hotel workers and staff. Um, I've passed bills that require the posting of the human trafficking hotline in every hotel, restaurant, bar, restaurant. And that, that was still rolling out, but 
Um, I, I'll say one anecdote that made me feel amazing was we had a um, our last task force meeting. I, I found out that you know we passed this bill requiring um, the the posting of the human trafficking hotline inside a hotel room in the back door, and I we got word from one of our hospital partners that they had a victim come in um, after calling that number and that, that the victim saw on the back of the hotel room door um, and ended up saving her life because she didn't know the hotline existed at all and not how to get help at all. Uh, and so was able to leave that trafficker from, from that bill. Um, and so I was so thankful, man, it, 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 you know, tear it up. Cause it was like, you know, something like this, you don't really know if it's going to work or not. Um, and you know, who knows how many other lives we'll save with it, but we got one. Uh, and it was a bill we just passed last year. And so it, it showed me that we're, we're heading in the right direction, but there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to raise awareness in our community about this issue. Um, and it goes beyond just, just sex trafficking. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues with, um, you know, how we treat, and you mentioned it, you know, domestic servitude um, and construction workers and employees are often, um, you know, may not always have uh, their proper immigration papers. And so sometimes they'll be trafficked to come in and do work and, and get their wage garnished or, you know, it's, it's a lot, man. It's it's devastating to hear what people go through uh, and what people are put through in the form of slavery. Um, so what I do want to, while, while I have, uh, you know, a couple minutes or a minute, um, but, you know, while you brought it up, I do want your listeners to know that if they have any concerns about potential trafficking or a potential situation that just doesn't seem right, they can call uh, the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888, or you can text HELP to BE FREE, which the number for that is 233-733. Uh, you can text that number uh, if you it just seems out of place. It's always, you know, one of those things where maybe if it seems off, just go ahead and report it. Um, and so, so that, um, you know, we, we, can, we can, we can make sure that, you know, if there are any red flags that they're investigating. Um, the last thing I would ask people to do, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, you can search for the Baltimore City Human Trafficking Collaborative. Follow us on, on social media. We, we are going to be launching some online training. We were doing in-person training before the pandemic all across the city of Baltimore just to educate people on what human trafficking was and, and how it can be prevented. Um, we're going to be taking that online since we can't do stuff in person right now. So follow us on social media as well. All right. So we're going to get that information up on the website after this interview. And uh, I want to thank, I mean, I want to thank you. I mean, from the bottom of my heart for you to come on, and give you a, you know, a little bit of time right now, this right here, anytime that you want to come on, this is your platform. Anything that you have going on, anything you want to get out here to the community, this is your platform. I really want to thank you for coming on today. Like I said, we, we had, you know, a great conversation. We uh, learned a lot of things. Uh, hopefully a lot of the listeners are here to learn a lot of things. So guys, Councilman Barnett, 8th District, Emerson Village, Irvington, 10 Hills, Dickey Hill, all of that. If you're in this area, go ahead, follow this man on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Councilman, I appreciate everything. I appreciate you coming through. And like I say, anytime you want to come back, just come on through. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. you too. There you go, you guys. You just you just heard it. Councilman Barnett, Baltimore City. Like I said, human trafficking, you know the signs, you see the signs. Anything is not looking right. You think it's something you see a or, you know, you see some child that's with someone and they feeling they looking right now like they Lord nervous, like they want to say something. Don't be nervous. Even if you know, if you do say something and 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 find and it comes to find out that it's it's not what you thought it was, but the parent can really probably appreciate, but that it's someone out here that's actually looking out. But um we learned a lot of things. And like I said, we're gonna have the councilman on here again. So is there any other questions, any other concerns, any other things that you want to learn about, that you want to know anything about about here that's going on here in our city right now? Let's holler at your boy. Streets Talk Podcast, we here for you. So whatever you want, whatever you need, we here for you. So like I said, I want to thank the councilman for coming on here today. I want to thank my viewers, my listeners. Like I said, this is going to be up on, this is going to be up um, later on today on podcasts, on, on all podcast streaming sources. So again, I want to thank you guys for coming on out today. We'll be back again. Street Talk Podcast, we here for you, shorty. We out of here. Peace.